Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the in-conversation session with Madhusri Datta, led by Veena Paul. Madhusri Datta is a filmmaker, curator, and pedagogue. She is currently artistic director of the Academy. Uh, I would like to invite her onto the stage, and I invite Veena Paul, artistic director and vice chairperson of Kerala State Chalchitra Academy. It's on, it's on. Hari. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. See, Hari ka naam lete, it started. Hari ka naam lete. This is the time. appear before the judge. So let us send good energy, positive energy that the judge uses his good faculties and makes a good judgment. So we'll start with that, right? Yes. <laughs> we'll make it. We'll make it. We hope we'll make it. Okay. So very honored to be with Madhushri as we all are. So I uh, have not prepared uh, this conversation traditionally to talk about her career, etc. because I don't think uh, either of us are at that stage in life when we can say, oh, I made that first film and I made, why did I make that first film? Why did I get into cinema? All that's done. We're all here. I would uh, rather like to talk about few ideas, see how uh, things have shaped in your mind, etc. <laughs> so, uh, would you like to talk about first, very broadly, uh, this form that you did choose at some point which you call documentary and which uh, sort of morphed into not being documentary almost or what this notion of documentary is, if you could talk a little about that it would be nice. Why you made certain choices? how these choices have uh, uh, changed, what shaped you into these changes? <laughs> That's a lifetime question, really. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so this is the apt question, maybe. Uh, Meena, as you know that I, I'm not a trained filmmaker. And uh, okay, she said you will not go there, why we have become filmmaker and how we have become filmmaker. But I'm definitely accidental filmmaker. Uh, I have not watched uh, documentary films because those days anyway it was very difficult except some of Deepa Dhanraj's film which I had to translate from Hindi to Bangla paradigm. You know those days, film society days, somebody come with a 69mm projector, show the film on the uh, street corner and somebody just from the crowd come and start doing paradigm. So once, so that was my 
one of the first documentaries that one watched, except the BBC films once in a while, or Max Muller Bhavan showing some German films. Never thought of this genre very seriously. It was not even a genre, a proper genre in India in those days. And um, but as happened that um, various other public events give give you different kind of direction, and uh, you respond to it, and you become somebody else, which which, which is wonderful. I mean, it's, it's not a question of regret or rejoice or any such thing. You just it just happened. So it so happened that I was a new migrant in Bombay and didn't know what to do. Like what everybody does, I used to assist um, in some kind of off Bollywood. Uh, fiction films. Not that I decided that I want to make fiction film. Before that, I had a theater background. And Bombay erupted, um, uh, one riots happened. And we wanted to document some of the uh, facets of the. Um, uh, we are talking about court, we are back to court after the whole lifetime, maybe. Uh, document some of the um, evidences uh, for any future court case. And that became my first film. I live in Verapara. But by the time the film got made, I never thought that it will be a film. So I had to watch uh, Amara Shah 20 times to understand <coughs> how our documentary is structured. Then I'm, I come from theatre, it's structured completely differently. But by the time the film got made, you know, I, I quite fallen in love. I thought that there's lots of possibilities. You can do all these things. All my love for fiction or theatre, then that's happened. Evidences, testimonies, real. Uh, they all then came together in my next film, because also what happened, because the, I live in Velampara is a complete documentary, which is a classical documentary. It can be taken as a, as a uh, classical documentary. While making that, I thought it's also a comfort level. I mean, I watched, I was quite young, a new a first filmmaker, but I watched people that when you watch this, there is a distance. I mean, it's okay. I mean, it's, it's there. I wanted to break that. I wanted to break the magic of testimony, the magic of real. So I th um, then thought, you know, very amateurishly in the beginning that uh, start working, mixing fiction and documentary images. Yeah. Uh, so scribbles with Akka, maybe you scribbles can talk about uh, on Akka. Maybe you can talk about that. Where um, I mean, you confront. Um, one, you've used an actor, which I thought was a very interesting device. Uh, secondly, uh, this confrontation of religion. And uh, I think today that's also an important question that we come back to that. Uh, uh, I think at that point when we spoke, you had said that, you know, you cannot avoid religion, you cannot avoid religion. But has that not changed now? Uh, do you not need to avoid religion now? Is there a need for that kind of thing? So if you could talk a little about uh, Akka and maybe how you look at that film today. Yeah. yeah? Vina is talking about uh, Akka because that's her favorite film. That's she always right. shows I, I it. Always so, show, yeah. so, um, and I have not seen it for the longest time. I don't even remember it very well. Never mind. It's made in 2000. Uh, Interesting because I, I, in a way, it, it, it uh, in my head is um, uh, cupped the 90s decade, uh, which started with Babri Masjid demolition, which in a way made me a documentary filmmaker. Not only me, I think there's a whole lot of us, a whole generation of us became a documentary filmmaker around that time. And then what happened is that. Um, Actually, uh, I think all documentary filmmakers and everybody maybe in this audience will be interested in this, that there is also a dichotomy of popular culture and public culture. And religion s stays in the middle of it. So I'm, of course, majorly atheist character. When I made Behram Para, I, I, I was there to say, complete separation between religion and state, and that is a private affair, and this is public, and you are not to bring your public f uh, private faith into public. I mean, I believe in all this, which today I think has become little uh, weak in his argument, in his rhetoric. Uh, but the, I, 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 I come from that very uh, uh, classical, staunch, um, atheist, um, leftist background. When I, I made uh, the films, which I made in the middle. But by the time I all, uh, made Akka, which is like almost uh, a decade after the Babri Masjid and Behram Para, 
is that uh, is also the feminist, which was the 80s, our decade, I mean our growing up decade is the 80s and that is the feminism. And that is also Ekeda Manujan introducing us to um, uh, the local literature and, and um, look, um, uh, other feminist artists and all are looking at uh, what are the discourses hidden in our life. So just because Mahadavi Akka is known as a religious icon, so this public icon which we need at that time for gender discourse or for discourse into a public behavior caste today, I mean how much um, uh, vachanas have talked against the caste which is so relevant today, we are we to let go of all this uh, legacy that we had uh, only because that religion by itself is now threatening to be popular culture. I mean that it is coming into the public space, somebody's private faith is coming to the public space and taking over the public space and pushing all other um, uh, all, all other entities out because of this reality if we let go of things like Mahadevi Akka, uh, Basavanna, uh, various other, other tradition, the local tradition, we will only be poorer and, and less equipped to deal with uh, this onslaught, religious onslaught, commercial religious onslaught that is happening. Okay, all these things are okay to think, think through, through, but how, how do you make the film then? As it is, is, is supposedly, I mean it could be even a fictitious character, 13th century writer, no script available, you do not even know it is written by one person or a whole village or a community of women or maybe not women, maybe by men, I mean you do not even know all these things, these are all hypothetical. In that, I am a documentary filmmaker, I want to talk about few facts, few political situation of uh, 2000 uh, based on that. So I had to have uh, fiction characters, I had to bring them and so the exercise is blending them into the reality. So when I am talking about um, uh, role of religion in the public space in uh, year 2000 and I am taking, uh, uh, going back to build my logic or build my argument to 13th century uh, um, um, uh, uh, poet. Uh, saint poet, who, who is called saint poet, uh, I have to bring uh, fiction, I mean not I have to bring, that is an artistic choice or political choice I would say, hmm. that um, imagination and when it is fiction I want to make it very clear, I want to bring imagination, I want to invite my audience to have some imagination, it is not only, see this is the evidence so you should believe in it, because all evidence are today used by the other side also, same evidence, so it is a hmm. question of argument evidence by itself does not make an argument. So for the argument you need to, one you need to have an ideology maybe and another thing that you have to have an imagination, imagination to see through the evidence or, or with through the evidence. Mm. For me it is fiction, fiction gives us that space to invite my audience also to have an imagination to see through the evidence. So I work with the evidence but I do not believe that evidence, only evidence really can bring forward the complex discourse that today we need to bring. Talk too much, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 please, yeah. No, because I was actually then moving towards memories of fear. Mm -hmm. Now from uh, Akka to memories of fear, what was that uh, journey and uh, no, I do not want to talk about the Manchester film, but I thought about memories of fear because of uh, what we are going through now, where fear, whether it is the city, whether, uh, you know, in all spaces now there is such a sense of fear now. Pina, now that you are reminding me and I am thinking, what have we done? I am sorry, I am feeling a little depressed after seeing Dipadhan Raj's film yesterday. What have we done? So all these issues, see a me to sexual harassment in workplace, that is the subject of memories of fear religion and public culture, that is the subject of Akka, communal violence, that is Vedampara, all these are haunting us even more now. So are we to say that we could not uh, make a difference, I mean who, who are we, but all of us together, I mean not only documentary filmmaker, but all kinds of, kinds of critical thinking, uh, I mean everything has come back and much more severe actually. Anyway, Memories of Fear actually was supposed to be my first film. I was actually writing that uh, script when uh, the riot happened and so made Berampara. So Berampara actually I always say that I have not made, it is the time which has made because I, there are 
Uh, Deepa Dhanraj also says that, that there is a time that activists will sit behind you in the editing room and say, we want this character, we want this dialogue and mm, you will have mm. to accommodate them mm. because he, he were uh, making a film on behalf of the movement. And, uh, but that did not work after a point, I mean not for Deepa, not for many people, but that's a good beginning to start with. So Memories of Fear in that sense was my first film and that film also came straightly out of the women's movement of that time, the domestic violence, the socializing of uh, young girls. But again, um, this is the articulation which, uh, articulation of childhood. Now articulation of childhood no child makes, right, it's an adult makes. So when an adult makes a testimony of the childhood, obviously it's, it's, it's not a uh, direct testimony, it's a direct, it's a testimony that you think had happened to you or the way you look at it. So there is always a space and the space is where imagination comes. So I, I was interested from the very beginning that to think that, um, that uh, interview format or um, testimony format is evidential and scripted format that is to actually deny no. the whole tradition of script and um, uh, literature to deny the space that that's also reality, that's also evidence. So mixing these two, I mean, very clumsily maybe sometimes, sometimes it works, rarely it works actually. But I, I wanted, I mean, so much, you know, you fall, fall in love with the um, documentary protagonist is very often it happens. You, you feel so attached, you feel so, I mean, you, you feel their pulses if it's a good documentary. It always disturbs. It, it always mm. made me that, uh, you know, we are not thinking critically, so any other evidence can come and swing our emotion to that way, right? If it is the real face, the real voice, the real experience, if we are talking about quote unquote real, then any other real coming which is happening today, so we will swing that way. So there has to be some other space between the real and what we take out of that real, there has to be some space for criticality. No, this is this goes around in form of, form of cinema. It sometimes works, sometimes it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Well, then that comes now to your next big love, which is the city, and uh, uh, Bombay, and your preoccupation uh, with your relationship with this city, uh, with the city itself, and also cinema in this city. We'll go to the Cinema City project later, but just uh, your relationship with this city, why, uh, uh, have you always felt an outsider or have you, do you feel like a Bombay Wala and what is this feeling of being a Bombay Wala and now uh, living outside, how much do you miss it, what is this, now what is the kind of attachment and uh, engagement with this city? You know, I, I, I left Bombay, I mean, temporarily I hope, uh, in, only in 2018 and while leaving, it, it was, I thought it would be very traumatic and I, because uh, everybody knows about my publicly declared love for Bombay. Um, uh, and uh, first time actually I felt that uh, when I'm leaving, I have become an insider. This whole act of leaving makes you in. But before that, for some 27 years I lived there, I was always coming, every morning is coming. A metropolis is like that, you are always trying to come in and that's the process. You are in various stages of coming in, it's almost like tires. And that's the whole thing, that whole lot of outside people who are coming in and they don't know wh what is in, at, at which point it becomes in, when are you in, that uh, you own one as they call BHK, one bedroom hall kitchen place in uh, Bombay, okay. then you become in, you have a Sarkari um, job, then you become in, you start speaking in Marathi, then you become in, you get a ration card in your name, then you become in, you don't know technically when you were in and emotionally also when you were in. So you always make this journey and that makes it very interesting uh, for me and I think that is good, it's good to be a little outsider, I mean I, w I would, if I'm given another life say today and I'll say I want to be that little outsider, that gives you a perspective, that gives you uh, an access, an angle which is different and um, so I now live in a, um, uh, uh, and all my life actually I'm a typical Indian in that sense that I lived in the cities whose local language I don't speak. 
27 years I still could not pick up Marathi. I studied in Delhi. I speak awful uh, Hindi. Uh, I'm a typical Bengali that way, you know, <laughs> that you don't pick up any other language. So you are always a little bit of odd. But I'm not even a Bengali because I'm not from Calcutta. You can become a Bengali only if you are from a particular city, that is Calcutta. And because I'm bo not born in Calcutta, they are also even little outsider, which I think is great. I mean, I'm, I mean, I mean, learned it through life and through uh, films maybe to enjoy that, to make it into a language that little off, that little offness is needed. So any, anybody I talk to, they, they cannot be my mirror, right? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not giving a testimony. I'm taking somebody else's testimony. So that being little off, which city, city gives you that opportunity. You are never, nobody is actually completely, you are not landlocked, right? So you, I mean, in any other, other if you are not urban, then you are, you are landlocked. Your family, your three generation in the same place, so everybody knows everybody, every, so that's it. So that out of landlockedness, urbanity interests me. And that, that little fragility of urban existence, which excites me. I mean, I, I like that headiness of it. I mean, that headiness of uh, little off. You know, today in Bandra, but to, if you don't do well, tomorrow you'll be Nala Sopara. That little, <laughs> I mean, I'm not romanticizing it, please. I'm mm. not romanticizing the homelessness or the, or the mm. ruthlessness of our urbanity. But I'm saying that this whole native thing has not given us very um, good situation today. So little bit of moving people, moving people, um, not so settled people, not so confident people, I'm interested in them. And that's why our urbanity uh, excites me. So the use of uh, Ismat Chuktai and uh, Sadat Hasan Manto. Would you talk a little bit about that? And uh, they are actually the two narrators. They are completely fictitious characters. This film was made in 2006. They died. I mean, Manto died in 1954. Um, Chuktai uh, died in 1992. Few days before Babri Masjid demolition, which is very interesting in Bombay. Uh, they, uh, so the, I, I bring them back in my film which I made in 2006 uh, like contemporary characters. So they are documentary characters because I am quoting directly from their writing, but it's writing, it's that's creative writing, not, not uh, testimonies. Uh, but I quote from the, uh, that, but they also comment on the 2006 affairs. So they, 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 again those two characters are mixed with uh, fiction and documentary. Thing. So, the real Manto and real Chuktai were there, but I am also investing them what I think if they were alive in 2006, what they would have said about the state of affairs. So, it's my fiction then. then so, their fiction, their documentary and then my fiction, maze of uh, the script it is anyway. <laughs> but, so, in that is why I am interested in them, they, they wrote in, and people who have not read uh, Chuktai and Manto, they wrote in uh, Urdu. They were member of um, Progressive Writers Association. Uh, they, uh, they, as um, many of you may know, uh, the, the, that time the state was after them, uh, other than political uh, reasons, also for obscenity, because uh, both of them, um, yeah, written few pieces which was that time uh, sexual morality was not so they were censored. But they, what people don't know, they're also from popular culture. They wrote typical Bollywood stuff. And Manto, in fact, did Yolo journalism, you know, mm. who is sleeping with whom kind of stuff. So they were die-hard Bombay people. They, they, like me, came from outside. And they are die-hard. They were in love with the city. And Manto, uh, when the partition happened, went to Pakistan. And Chukta was very upset. We are communist people. We, don't, we are not going to a country which is coming in the name of religion. We are not going to a Hindu or Muslim country. So Manto said, no, uh, basic, primarily I am a Urdu writer. And in this secular country of uh, yours, there will be no space for Hindu writers. So I am going. Chuktai got very moralistic about it and was very upset. Chuktai lived in Bombay till 1992, as I told you. Never wrote a single line on Bombay. Wrote about everything wrote about Lucknow, wrote about Alibag, wrote about Delhi, never, go and find, uh, try to find Chuktai, oh, never really? wrote on Bombay. Manto went Always. to Pakistan, was very unhappy, every morning used to get up and write on Bombay. So who leaves and who stays? Again, what is fiction, what is the, uh, documentary? So that excited me, this whole thing about migrants are every morning trying to come to the um, uh, city 
and then uh, not really reaching there and when you leave actually you arrive I mean which happened in my life after a few years and uh, yeah so that's the excitement try, try to bring that that actually living and going is, 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 is more experiential than physical and it goes in round and round we are every time every day we are trying to reach and every day we are also departing sounds very philosophical it's not that it's very <laughs> concrete yeah yeah so then comes the huge project that you wanted to launch first in Trivandrum yeah. and we never got down to doing it, which is Bombay Cinema City. Uh, so yeah, so you talk, I think all your concerns finally seem to have culminated in the Bombay Cinema City project. Why, will you talk about that a bit? about? Uh, uh, first of all, what the project is, many people might not know what it was and also about uh, what drove you to do it uh, and how, how satisfied or how uh, fulfilling was it for you uh, to have done that project because I know it was, it took up so much of your life. Seven and, years. Yeah, seven years and did you uh, in any sense reach uh, what you did want or thought you had set out to uh, reach that, out to. Uh, I mean, as somebody else will have to decide, but I can tell you wh wh why I thought of such a project. Wh one thing is that uh, personally for me, uh, uh, I, I have not made a film for, for the longest time, so that makes me a retired filmmaker or a former filmmaker or one such thing. Uh, just tell them what the project is. Huh? What the project was. Huh, huh. Yeah. So uh, once I that we uh, stopped making films, but do, by then documentary uh, it started exciting me, and I thought it is not only one screen based testimony. Documentary is a way of looking at things. That this evidence, testimony, reality within that memory, all these things come. It's a practice. It's, 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 a, it's a, a intellectual, political practice, and it needs to be practiced many ways. Not break your films into that can be done. It's difficult, but it can be done. That you do something more that you invest documentary logic, documentary culture, documentary practice uh, into more and uh, also collective. We wanted to do some collective things. And as all of you know that Bombay is obsessed with itself and with its own cinema. It, it has its own problem, it kills other cinema, it, uh, it kills uh, within its other voices, documentary voices and uh, uh, other, other kind of fiction film. It makes others of everything but it itself is another. So it's a major other and it, it, then it, it uh, makes other others. So it's, 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 I was vaguely interested if you live in that city you slowly slowly get interested not because of the stardom or because of the kind of films or the stories or the success. You get interested because the city produces image. Every morning a whole lot of people get up and their livelihood is to somehow or other to be attached with the image. So if the city that makes steel called steel city, the city which makes textile that's called cotton city, uh, chemical city. So is the city which makes cinema and a whole lot of people are involved with cinema, can it be called cinema city? Now there is a problem, still you know this is produced, so and so worked in this, so and so worked in this and this is produced. So cinema is produced by the time who worked and their relationship is very difficult to establish. Somebody has stitched a button, somebody has made one hair, they don't even know for whom they have made Carried it. Carried a can. Lot of, yeah. lot of salt shop culture. People have no idea for whose eyebrow you are stitching. You are not stitching an eyebrow. It's going for Vishwa Pitamaha in some Mahabharat version. So if you knew, you could have sold that idea, but you cannot. So and then you, a whole lot of migration is happening towards that. Now this migration, very interestingly, provides the city cheap labor, not only in cinema. See, I, I, I mean, we have made lots of films on this uh, later on in this. Cinema City project is like say one uh, person who thinks that he can write. So he comes to become a, a script writer in uh, Bombay who has no idea screenplay, dialogue, this and that. So he becomes a uh, watchman. watchman, security guard. I think the film was shown here also, mm. a security guard. Uh, but as a security guard he will never be unionized because tomorrow morning he will be a script writer, right? 
So only tonight he is role playing. He is playing a role of the security guard. So he is in a transit camp where he is acting what you think he should be, that is security guard. But actually he is a script writer and tomorrow morning he will be that. So he will not be unionized. He, you can make him work for a, any minim, less than minimum wage thing. So that this aspirational migration, actually cinema does not employ that many people. Actually there are other industries which uh, employ most of the people. But everybody has an ambition in cinema. Everybody, they may do anything else, but they think that tomorrow they will be Shah Rukh Khan. And Shah Rukh Khan did this uh, thing because he is supposed to be a nobody and he came and became a star. So I am not interested in the stardom culture in that sense, but I am interested in all these things which make the urbanity, the heady urbanity. Because tomorrow I will be something else, today I will tolerate anything. You, make, you can make me do anything. So I was interested in that. So we tried to investigate into that because even if this person's testimony, if you go only with a documentary attitude, it's a sad case. But think about it, this person coming from a village, maybe having a little uh, settled uh, settle livelihood pattern also there, but he does not want. He was the headiness of aspiring to be Shah Rukh Khan. Maybe he also know that he can never be Shah Rukh Khan, but this headiness of sleeping with a dream, which a more settled life do not give you. Again, I am not romanticizing urbanization, but when we talk about menace of urbanity or overdevelopment, we must remember that it also deals with people's desire and dream. And documentary also needs to deal with dream and desire. It cannot only do with the sadness and the, uh, and the failure of the system or whatever. So this project was a madness project as most of, most of my projects. It has um, architecture, it has um, of course fiction, performance, visual art, um, uh, uh, land record, you know, wha uh, what maps. Uh, maps, lots of maps like who lives where. Now this aspiring scriptwriter lives where in the city and if tomorrow seriously, I mean one in a million, he does become a star writer, then where he will live. So what, what will be the route and what, what is the land record in that route. So various such things. So it was a huge interdisciplinary project between architecture, urban development, cinema and cinema in a very typical, call it uh, research art and documentary practice. So, uh, research art in the sense as we do the research, it is immediately out uh, as art. It is not that research is done separately and art is made uh, separately. Like I will give you an example, we made a bioscope. Uh, literally, I mean what will be the bioscope in 2010? So, we actually made a bioscope where you can go and you can play around with that. But inside, uh, what is there was the snippets of timeline. When Sipshana started, what was the first talkie film in India? What was the first um, um, uh, air conditioned theatre in uh, Bombay? These are the kind of um, snippets. You will have to play around with that and create a right chronology which you think is history. You think Sipshana, first um, air conditioned um, theatre and first talkie is one um, history or no? It, it can be three different histories. So you go on playing with. There are thousands of such informations. You go on playing with that information and make a chronology of what you think should be the chronology of history. This is one way of doing public history. Is he's doing history with the public, uh, uh, asking everybody to take part of creating the chronology which you think is right chronology or relating to it. So it's encouraging people uh, with history making and also. Um, questioning the monolithic dominant kind of history. Well, for me, these are all documentary practice. So I am asking my audience to come and do documentary. You may not make a film, but you can make a chronology. You can make, write, write a uh, one page history or whatever. So these are various games that we uh, played and put it in the public place. People came and played. Um, but this all came from my um, desire and experience of making documentary film, definitely. But it went some other way. So I didn't make any film since then. <laughs> so you haven't made a film since then, but you have not, not been doing anything. So we have to also open it up to the audience. So one last question about your practice now. You are the artistic director at the, uh, what, the Museum of World Art, <laughs> Academy of World Arts in Cologne in mm. Germany. She lives in Germany now. Uh, so what are, why 
uh, from being the artist, you became the artistic director. Is there, you know, today, this morning, it's really interesting that uh, we showed a film today on Angelopolis. And this was a film that I had seen and I had really liked and I uh, showed it here. And I felt so pleased to be showing the film, you know. There was a sense of, uh, and, and I was sort of thinking in my own mind, what's happening here? I've not made this film, uh, but I'm only showing it and I'm only sharing it over here. So, but there is that sense of achievement yeah, yeah. or there is that sense of satisfaction. Uh, so, if you could talk a little about this shift and what you're doing now and... Uh... Well, I'm going to say something very controversial, I'm sorry. Sure. I think too much has been made. Too much has been made and with digitality, too much is being made. So, don't... It's, the question, it's a question of... Um, uh, my fellow uh, filmmaker, Onirvan, um, hmm. that says a very nice thing. He made a film called Waste. And in, a, in one day, in a Q&A, he said, as filmmaker today, uh, the most collusion legacy that I have is waste. So I'm learning recycling, which I think uh, that statement stayed mm. with me. I think it's mm. a very great statement. And I think that uh, image making or even narrative making, you know, we have been doing it for such a long time. I mean, the whole humankind, uh, we did it. Uh, Today, we need to see that wh what can be done within that. So, I'm, uh, uh, anyway, for, for some time, I'm getting interested in archiving mm. and the various kind of access, this whole logic of access, that we, we are going on producing things, things are not having, the access, the politics of access, politics of access as a documentary practice. This has been interesting me and really, I have not made a film. You know, when we started, it was more difficult to make film in some sense. Of yeah. course, politically, it is difficult today. but economically, yeah. today it is easier. So, I didn't feel that desire also very strongly, I would have otherwise, uh, because because of this, I thought that even more um, narrative, even more images, before that, we need to take stock of what we have already produced. And so, I'm very interested in found footage filmmaking, uh, uh, archiving, um, students, uh, somebody told me that my, all my films uh, rushes are available uh, online and somebody told me that uh, you don't feel bad i said you know what i made the films it has gone around whatever I had success did not have success after 10 years if some young stars take the rushes and the film better than me uh, it will be exciting i may not be <laughs> very glad but it will be <laughs> exciting I, w I would wait for such a moment to happen uh, so i think that we need to take stock what we have already produced and what it has uh, to say today in that context, re-evaluating, re, um, re-arranging and uh, recycling of the images. So, I am interested. So, to being curated, uh, artistic director means programming as you know very well. And programming gives you that opportunity, exactly what you said about Angelopoulos' film. That gives you that opportunity and curating that way is like documentary, you know. Uh, uh, I mean, I will tell you one thing, I think uh, novel documentary film and curating has some very uh, queer um, relationship with it that it's very episodic and it's uh, you you can make a connection completely differently i mean curating you can do that it's like documentary filmmaking a whole seven days festival can be can look like a, a dramaturgy can look like a film script because that is how you can make a connection so these things excite me so i'm trying to follow you oh <laughs> well okay so can we open this out can't see anything. Who's got the mics? Yeah. Somebody there to ask you. Madam, do you think that with the, uh, the giddy urbanity in Bombay, with its aspirational migration, you, uh, do you feel it, it is like a surreal collage, the city? <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm not very sure I, I understood your question, but uh, let's see. Me, uh, that I don't know what, what do you actually mean by surreal uh, collage, but it's definitely it's a, it's a city uh, it's, uh, uh, that people live in. A whole lot of people live in, not people, 21 million or maybe definitely more than that because everybody is not counted. Uh, but um, uh, people who live right there, maybe live all their life there, they also negotiate the city 
through their understanding of cinema, which is very interesting. I will give you an example. I, I, I was interviewing a woman who was at that time will be late 30s, who was born in the suburb of Bombay, which is Santa Cruz, which is not a right, distant suburb, which is quite in the city. She is a uh, domestic uh, worker and she was giving me, she said, I am a film buff. So, I was interviewing her. She had the experience of watching Parda cinema. You remember that on the street, mm -hmm. they used to put curtain and you could see it both ways. So, I went to uh, interview her on the Parda cinema and she started telling me, you know what, last year I went to town. Now, if you are in Bombay, town means the colonial city, which is the southernmost part of it. And I saw building, I, I saw um, uh, the sea and I saw railway line and uh, lots of cars. It's exactly like film. Now, she is negotiating her own city through the memory of Amitabh Bachchan running through Marine Drive. It's exactly like film. So, the film is her documentary uh, memory and what she is experiencing herself is a kind of fiction. So, people live in, but people also live in the imagination of the city, of the same city that they live in. It's not like they are dreaming of Chicago or uh, uh, Tokyo, <laughs> they are dreaming of Bombay, living in Bombay. So, yeah, in that sense, definitely surreal. Yeah. Who is? Yeah. Somebody here, somebody there. Hi. Um, I have a question about um, the Bollywood marquees, which is, as I understand it, sort of a dying art. And when I used to live in Bombay, we had, there was a fellow who was one of the last marquee, the, the Painter. painting, painters, yeah. right. Hmm. So, and the billboard he told us that sometimes he, you know, he wouldn't even see the movie, but he would just imagine that this movie probably should have a monkey in it. So he'd put a monkey in it just because the, it became his imagination of a desire to have the full story arc uh, before you go in to see the film. And whether you think, getting back to your point about the security guard or the woman who saw herself uh, who saw South Bombay as, a, as, yeah. a, as living in a film, what that has done and if, there's, if that's a conversation that's happening in the film industry. Thanks. Actually, um, I made a film on this, um, uh, this, um, this convention uh, which was there um, in the festival called Made in India where this uh, guy is there. But never mind, I'll tell you. Actually, I, I, I'm like you, I'm also interested in this um, practice, so I followed it a bit. It's very interesting. Is one is that they is still there. It's still there. Now it is more as original. Now these are huge boards, 30 foot by 20 uh, feet. You can imagine how six such boards. Uh, it's, it's still happen in Pillar House ga behind Grant Road, where these paintings are made every week. Six paintings of 30 feet by 20 feet. Just try to imagine how how much work is there in one studio. It's still there, but there are many such things. Very interestingly, it goes up for a week or two weeks because earlier film used to run for longer. It brought down and it used to got erased because the canvas is very expensive. So next week's uh, uh, banner will be made on that only. Okay. So it is not original. In the sense that original was every day erased. Today, because we want we want a little bit of nostalgia, we want a little bit of uh, analog, uh, uh, though we actually uh, live by uh, digital. So today it is flicks, uh, banners everywhere, but one or two such studios are kept. So one or two such, like uh, tomorrow, uh, IDF may think that, no, 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 we also want the hand paint, uh, painter because we want to uh, pay tribute to their legacy. So those studios are kept. But otherwise, if you look at flex um, uh, banner, flex you cannot recycle, because I'm also interested in recycling. You cannot recycle. So a flex banner, it is there for whatever days, and then it's out. But the canvas will come back, and the painter himself will erase it every week after week, our original painting of Madhuri Dikshi or Sri Devi or that. So it's very interesting. My problem is that it soon will become a rare art where it was a livelihood art. It was not even an art, it was a livelihood craft. But now it, it is um, uh, getting uh, into real art and now uh, contemporary visual artists, modernist artists are practicing, practicing it, uh, some, like somebody like Atul Dodia, who is particularly interested in this genre. Yeah, I don't know that I answered your question, but... Uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> You just mentioned that we have been working with narratives for so long and there needs to be something, uh, there needs to be an alternate sort of uh, form that we have to take with narrative itself. So my question is that now in, 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 in times, especially with documentary pra practices, you know, things like uh, the whole idea of being politically correct, this whole idea of, of having a social message of being politically correct and being politically sensitive, that has sort of become a sort of a uh, commodity, uh, a product itself in that sense. Say, you know, in mo many of the films we see that Islamophobia is, 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 is a product. It's, it's not but dealt with. But that's very politically incorrect. That's uh, not correct. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that's incorrect. That's, that's, so the question is, the, the question is that the films are getting more politically aware, the, they are getting politically may be correct in that sense. In, uh, but with, with respect to form, the form that we are choosing uh, to te tell our stories and you know, uh, to sort of negotiate with these uh, ideologies and these issues, the form is very conventional and very, very, very uh, commercial in that sense. So how do we really yeah. deal with the form itself? The, the, sub the subject, the content, we are getting aware about a lot of things in the world, especially in today's time. You know, uh, everybody's wanting to be politically correct, everybody's wanting to say the right things, but the form is very, very commercial and very capital in that sense. So that means, uh, that so you and I have an agreement, and then most of us are here will be, that, uh, that this whole reality, testimony, real people, real location, real issue, these are all co got commercialized. These are all got incorporated and uh, commercialized within the um, huge uh, television industry and that. So today, problem is that documentary form, which is popularly known as documentary form, is completely, we associate with the various uh, talk shows and reality shows and um, news and all this. Uh, and they, of course, they, they and if, if we associate political correctness with that form, that means all Arnav Goshamis and everybody will then become um, turn, uh, politically correct in our eyes. And that has be happened, and that is the problem. Yes, I completely agree with you. I, I agree with you to the extent of maybe annoying some of my dear friends and colleagues. Uh, I think documentary needs to change this. Documentary film needs to change this form. I'm not interested in documentary. I'm not interested in reality. I'm interested in a political argument. And for that, whatever uh, that, uh, kind of narrative, whatever kind of non-narrative is needed, I'm OK with that. And if one form has become incorporated, how much do we fight to save the form? I'm not committed to the form. I'm committed to the cause. And for that, uh, I mean, I, I'll not fight uh, with Arnav Goswami that this is the way we ask questions, how dare you do it. I'll, I'll change of relating with people and asking questions. Yeah, form needs to be changed. And we need to invest a lot on form today only because we want to create another her ways of telling stories so many times, going with, uh, uh, going with changing times, why can't we um, change that? Form is very important. Form is, uh, sometimes is more important than anything else because form itself pushes, pushes certain politics and certain discomfort and certain uh, marriage. I mean, people say that I'm too obsessed with form. I mean, Gina also says that. She's not <laughs> saying it now. now. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Uh, so yesterday I saw the documentary I Live in Bairampada. So uh, the riots happened like two years before I was born. Uh, my mother, she lived in Mumbai while the thing was happening. And so the only knowledge I have are accounts from her and her brother. Uh, so when I see it, even today. So uh, when you said that you feel depressed when you see it, and I'm like. Uh, uh, people who are, I don't know, who think that this is something that uh, something new and something that needs to be addressed today. And when we see that the things <laughs> that happened 
are exactly, almost exactly the same and people are responding in exactly the same ways as they used to and they're telling the same stories again and again. I don't know, I was just uh, wondering how oh, you could. How yeah, that's true. Yeah. But that's true. I mean, uh, so, so we also need to understand, that, uh, identify the design first because we have seen it. We know it has happened in 1992. We know it has happened in 1994. We know that there is a design and we should be able to smell, to recognize the, uh, 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 what should I say, like, like a, uh, like, like a uh, season forecast that, uh, okay, it's going to rain. I mean, I, I, I could make out there with a communal uh, unrest because this is what happened exactly before uh, the orchestra uh, violence. These are the, these are the indications. Yes, as ordinary citizens, we need to feel this alertness uh, among us. Uh, because we have seen these films, I mean, before that, Ramkenam um, was made, um, uh, Hamara Shahar was made, Deepa made Kehwa Is Shahar Ko on Hyderabad. So, so we, ha we have, uh, Okay, they have lots of tools. They have their drill machines and hub pans. But we also have these things. We, we also have assets which we can build up on our experience, our argument, our, our um, common sense, our alertness. I mean, that only I can say. And uh, you were so young that you were born two years after that, so what to say? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Perhaps this should be the last yeah. question. Yeah, hi, good afternoon. Hmm? Um, my question is again related to what you just said. Uh, we've had uh, we've had loads of great documentary filmmakers documenting a lot of important events uh, that have happened. Um, but my question is um, in in India. Uh, my question is more regarding the access to documentaries. Um, it's it's not very easy. On one hand. Um, I would imagine documentary filmmakers don't necessarily look at monetizing from their work. They do it um, out of passion. They do. Nobody gives them money. So that's absolutely I, I, everybody I gives money. You. But, but it usually there is no quantification like films for the monetization that comes through documentary. Uh, but having said that, I still, um, you know, over the years I've come to believe, uh, you know, there are more, probably more takeaways from documentaries because the, they're more realistic. If I would make a film based on an incident, I would not include all facets of my research in it, either to make it more interesting or to make it more consumable or to make it a better. So uh, my question is the need of the art, I think, um, in our country right now is, uh, like you said, uh, we've had uh, Ram Kenam, we've had uh, uh, the Yeshaher, and then uh, I watched uh, your documentary on Berampada, and then I watched uh, Deepa's documentary yesterday. All these are mind-blowing pieces of documentation, and I strongly believe that we will not have, um, you know, so much indifference in the society if everyone watches it or reads about it. No one has the patience to read today. Documentary is more effective in the sense that it's a visual medium. Uh, I very strongly believe that. It has to be more accessible, and uh, there's no better people to do it than you folks who have led uh, the documentary movement, I would say, 70s, 80s onwards, at least the ones that I have watched. You know, there is a time in 70s, 80s when all these facilities were not there. This is even my, before my time uh, that uh, documentary filmmakers actually carried a projector and film cans used to be quite heavy go to remote places or with a screen. So screen, I mean, uh, uh, Amrit Gangar is sitting here, if he can tell you more in detail, and short films. But, okay, various things happen because that carrying things is okay. And no, everybody has, has the uh, need or desire or willingness to share the film with uh, people. But there is to be political network who will take you to the remote place. You cannot just go in a cycle and stop at any village who, who do not know a single soul and start filmmaking. So it needs something else. It needs a kind of network of either film society or uh, uh, libraries or youth clubs, football team, uh, communist party, uh, women's organization, anything, any such network. Any, so there has to be a vibrant democratic process in the country for this film to be seen. The audience will not come only because I want to show the film. Audience will come because audience, you have invited them. Mina Paul has invited them. IDS has invited them. They have a goodwill with the local audience. Audience come for them, not for me. 
then I happen to be here, so they watch my film. So it depends on many things. It's not it's on YouTube. Have you seen it? All my films are on YouTube. Yeah. All my films are on YouTube. All the past films are on YouTube. I'll be honest. So it's not an individual. I, I mean, uh, of course you can say that why people don't know it is on YouTube. Then they are going to blame, counter blame, but what I'm going to say, everybody is trying. That time people carried. Now we all have given our copyright on these things and uh, I mean, it's, these are old films also and they are all av available on YouTube. Okay. Very, very quick follow up comment. Um, the only reason um, I watched uh, uh, the Anand's film yesterday was because I knew A, uh, Anand's film was on YouTube and, uh, and it, it would be accessible and B, it was cancelled. I wanted to watch it on the big screen but I mm -hmm. couldn't. But I mean, no regrets. I mean, the first film actually blew my mind. I, 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 I took half an hour to actually compose myself after I watched it. But having said that, we spoke about analog and digital, just the last comment. Um, we have a digital media. I know it takes a little bit of money to host content digitally, but not as much as sending reels and booking theaters. People can watch it on their personal devices, and people do so. Um, and I'm not saying someone... No, no, I agree with you, definitely. So I, I'm saying in today's world, um, if, if someone makes it accessible, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, there are a lot of people out of their own interest who will go and access it. And that will be a great thing for the society, uh, if not for the form of documentary or, or film yeah. as such. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I mean, I'm just hoping that well, someone really does that. I completely agree with your concern and I just want to tell you that uh, not only films, also the film rushes because sometimes we edit a film on such a way that is that that time it was needed. Like say when I was making I Live in Bhagampara, it was Sri Krishna Commission needed these kind of evidences and the film was edited like that. But today maybe the need is different and the footage has that possibility which we did not realize at that time. Because one, because maybe I, I was a bad filmmaker or uh, my editor was inefficient or it was not the need of the time. But today it is the need of the time. So even documentary footage should be put uh, into the um, uh, this thing, it should be taught, it should be asked um, 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 media students and film students to make found footage films out of that. For that we started a platform, please uh, visit it called Padma, P-A-D dot M-A, Public Access Digital Media Archive, where we upload unedited documentary rushes, Pankaj Rishi Kumar whose film is also here, Saeed Mirza, um, all my films, everybody's rushes are there, not only films, the rushes are there. You can download and do anything you want to do. I'm so glad I asked you yeah. this question. Thank you. How do we say thank you to Madhushri by giving her a lifetime achievement award? <laughs> Thanks.